Hello, I am Young Penitent, and welcome to my Icon Corner once again. Today I am going to be reviewing a series of books which is put out by the St. Herman Press, the Optina Elders series. This is a series of lives of saints that have been translated into English for us and made available. I have just finished reading The Life of Elder Nikon. And this is the last, this one was just published about, um, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And this is the last, the, I don't know if it's going to be the final. Um, it might be the final because he was in a, in a way, the last Optina Elder. Um, but it's the last of the series that they have, the most recent of this, of this book series, which they have published. And um, so I have now read the entire series. This is a nine part series of books. And so now that I've read all of them, I feel, felt like I would, should, uh, do a stream on the, the Old Tina Elders, let you know about them, um, because it's a great, it's, you know, it's a great, they're great books, and I, uh, I think everybody should read them. So I'm going to give a positive review of these books today. My previous stream was a episode one of my series on, um, the Complete Idiot's Guide to Orthodox Christianity. And I do, God willing, I, I will be able to continue that series. I have an, an idea for maybe my next stream for episode two. So that's coming down the line. The one I, the one I did uh, five days ago was um, the stream. I did, my most recent stream was... Uh, about your first visit to your first Orthodox liturgy. And, um, you know, like I say, I always have some thoughts about my streams. If you didn't watch it, go ahead. Go, You can go back. Maybe after you finish this one, you can go back and watch that one. It, you know, um, I think it was a good stream. I did have a thought. What if somebody, you know, goes to their first liturgy? This is referring to my previous stream. What if somebody goes and they don't have a good uh, experience, you know, people, someone maybe worked up the courage to look up an Orthodox church and go to this service, which is often, you know, a little bit intimidating sometimes for people. It can be depending on, you know, depending on the parish, it, you know, the, sometimes, um, you go there and it's kind of foreign and strange to, to people. What if you had a bad, what if nobody talked to you? What if you, you can't, you came and you've tried to stay, but everyone just kind of ignored you, and you didn't have necessarily a good experience. You didn't feel welcome. And, you know, sometimes this happens, unfortunately. And that's the only church in your area. There's no other, there's no other parish within, my, you know, 100 miles of you. And, if, you know, it'd be too much to drive to, you know, two, two and a half hours to go to the parish in the large city that, you know, in your state or something. Well, you know, I do have a piece of advice for you if that's the case. I would say don't give up because you know you're in the right place in the, with the Orthodox Church because this is the true faith. So don't give up if that is the case. If that's happened to you, um, I would say just go back. And you what you're going to have to do is sort of make it your, your responsibility it is going to become your responsibility. To, you're going to have to take initiative uh, to um, join the church. If no one's helping you, no one's holding your hand, you know, well, then it's time for you to take to take the charge. So you, I would just go back and just, you know, because um, Christ has a commandment. You know, he says... Um, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So a priest, if someone is coming and wants to learn the faith and wants to get baptized, a priest cannot turn you away according if he if he's following Christ's commandments. So just start coming and just push through and use and use perseverance and persistence, you know, and 
in, insist on trying to trying to talk to the priest and get instruction and, and, and guidance and, you know, ask questions, ask and you'll receive. OK, that kind of thing. That was just my thought on my previous stream. I always have to I always have to start with some thoughts on my previous stream. And uh, so and also I want to, I always like to talk about my channel. You know, I'm a little narcissistic, maybe, but that's OK. I admit it. I, uh, you know, still growing. Um, I did, you know, I, uh, I felt like I sort of lost a little bit of momentum on my last couple streams because the first um, idiots guy got a lot of views. And then the next stream wasn't kind of wasn't as good. Didn't have it wasn't quite as uh, appealing due to the, you know, the title and all that. And I sort of lost some momentum. So I'm trying to gain that back. But you can't stop me. There's no one can stop me. I'm here. I'm talking. I'm on YouTube. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep pushing through. So get used to it, YouTube. Get used to it, everybody. Young Penitent is here. He is back with a vengeance. Okay, so back to my the book review. As I said, I finished this uh, ninth book in the series, Elder Nikon. And so this one is, is fresh in my mind. The rest of them... Uh, I sort of have to go from from memory, but um, I want to first talk, start off talking about the lives of saints in general. Um, St. John Chrysostom says, you cannot be saved without reading the lives of saints. And back in his time, when you're reading lives of saints, usually it was stories of, uh, you know, saints going, being called before, you know, governors and kings and um, confessing their faith in, faith in Christ. And when they knew that, um, when they knew that that confession of Christ would result in their death, because for the first few centuries of Christianity, it was illegal and people were getting killed and martyred. So it is good. It is, it's, you know, you can read and reread. If you read the prologue, for example, here is the prologue. You know, this is like a kind of a daily reading. It's a two- it's a big two-part, two two volume series um, set of books that you can read. If you read those books, like um, every day they can they write a few lives of saints, and you, at least one of them is going to be this person got raked over hot coals with, with rusty irons and nails, and the worst things that you could possibly imagine happened to those saints. And it is just a good. It is just a good reminder. It's you can like you got you can drill that into your head by re, you know I read I try to you know read a couple of lives of saints every of those short lives every day, and it's it's you cannot read enough of that. You need to it's good it's good for Christians to drill into your head uh, this 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 idea that we must be willing to suffer for Christ, um, because you know maybe the time will come. You know, your confession of Christ is the most important thing for your salvation. If you confess Christ with your tongue, you're doing that. That's like an outward, outwardly showing your what's what's in your heart. And if you deny Christ, Christ will deny you. So it's it's good. It's a good lesson to learn to repeatedly read over and over how these saints were, um, how these saints suffered. Uh, but those lives are short. If you re if you're reading the prologue, it's usually a couple, a uh, a couple, you know, a paragraph or two. But it, it, if you're reading um, a whole book on somebody, then you really can you really can get to know those saints. You know, it's it's a little it's a lot more detail, and you get to know how they grew up, and what their teachings were, um, and so I mean it's 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 good to continually have like you know a life of saint on your bedstand, for example, or something like that, because you learn, you get to know them. It's like they, they become part of your, your existence. And I have a warm memory of the Oaktina elders from reading this, this series of books. They, they were just so filled with uh, humility and wisdom and they're, they're uh, down to earth, you know, um, which is a kind of a, a, uh, it's one of the characteristics of uh, Russian Orthodoxy is it it's that the their saints are down to earth, you know. So 
the who are the Optina elders? These were some holy men who um, Optina is a monastery that was was first established in the uh, was it the 16th century, I believe, and then it kind of fell into um, disrepair under Saint um, under Catherine the Great. Uh, the Empress of Russia at, at that time was uh, she was withdrawing funding and making it she was in general making it difficult for monasteries. And so monasticism sort of became like out of favor in Russia for a while and it kind of fell into you know disrepair this monastery. But then it was reestablished uh, at first in the 17th century but um, it uh, came, it, it really came to fruition in the 19th century uh, under the Otina elders. And these Otina elders were, um, they were following a tradition that was started by St. Paisius Velichkovsky. And he is very important. He was like the, the seed. St. Paisius uh, was really the person who was responsible for the flowering of sanctity that occurred in Russia and Russian monasteries in general, and especially in Otina. And so he was a, he was a monk who um, got his start in the Kiev caves, and he and then he went Lavra, and then he went to Mount Athos. And on Mount Athos, he started to read and study um, the sources, the patristic texts, the sources of spiritual life in the Orthodox Church, and he was reading them. And he was translating them from Greek into Slavonic. And this is very important. Spiritual literature is very important to our lives. Um, and you can, you know, it can be, it was partially, you know, due to St. Piusius' uh, influence was, um, the, you know, these books that he produced were, so, were a large, in large part, responsible for this flowering of sanctity. So he went to Athos, and he started to gather disciples around him, and he sort of outgrew. He he basically outgrew the the uh, skeet where he was, because he started to gather so many disciples around him that it was becoming a problem. And so he moved back to Molda Moldavia, and he started translating these works. And, um, and he gathered like 700 monks around him in his monastery in Moldavia. And his disciples were the ones he had basically was the one who started this tradition of eldership. And his disciples, um, uh, especially uh, most notably St. Theodore of Sanaxar, were the elders of the Optina elders who learned, they learned it from him. They learned the inner life, the spiritual life, the hesychastic life and the Jesus prayer. So, um, you know, this, this goes to show this, how important spiritual literature is also because they were learning this stuff from books. Um, you know, you learn, you can learn the spiritual life from people and from books. Books are, you know, it's like two sides of the same coin. And I, it reminds me of King Josiah, uh, in the uh, in the Old Testament, you know, because he he had a priest who brought found the book of the law and brought it to him. And he started to weep and he said, you know, we need to we haven't been following the law. And he he um, he reestablished its practice. And so that just shows how how influential a book can be, how important it is. Um, so what is eldership? Eldership is in, in Greek, I mean, in Russian, the word is starchestvo. And um, a, an elder is a starets, and plural, it's startsy. And so an elder is a person, he is fulfilling the uh, prophetic ministry of the church. He's an unerring guide. He is able to show to his disciples and those who come to him for direction, God's will for them in their life. And they have what is the, known as the gift of discernment, which is in St. Paul writes about that in Corinthians. And he mentions this. And among monastics, the gift of discernment is called, it's known to be the highest, uh, the highest gift that a person can receive. It's uh, very highly valued. 
And in Greek, the word is yerinda for elder. But uh, there's a little bit of a difference in between eldership, you know, the word yerinda and the word starets in Russian and in Greek, because uh, in Rus the Russian tradition, we use this word a little more sparingly, and it's, it's kind of more specific. Um, in Greek monasteries in general, they'll call the spiritual father of the monastery, they'll call him yerinda, but not necessarily... We don't just, in the Russian tradition, we don't just necessarily call the abbot, you know, of a monastery, Yerinda, or the elder, because that's not what it, an elder is like a, a, a distinction, someone who is, uh, like I said, an unerring guide, and you might not necessarily, so it's kind of a, there, there are differences in tradition, you know, between the Greek and the Russian and even others, um, for example, like in monasticism, in the Greek, in Greek monasticism, the uh, the great schema is given out a little more liberally. In Russian, in the Russian tradition, the great schema, uh, when a person becomes a schema monk, that is usually given either at the end of someone's life or if someone's going to be going into seclusion because the rules that they have to follow, you know, is so strict that they wouldn't be able to live among other people or you know, you couldn't be really an elder, like a, it would be hard to be a schema monk and fulfill your rule while, for example, receiving pilgrims uh, and giving uh, and giving advice to people. And, you know, you sort of are leaving the world like even more than you already have at that point. So these these elders, the, the Ultina elders, they had this, uh, you know, they had this charism and people were coming to them in flocks. There was always a line outside of the mon their, uh, the gates of the St. John the Forbunner ski, which was a little, which was a little ways off from the Otina monastery. And it was kind of dependent on that monastery. And they were, they were like all, you know, all day long giving advice and giving direction to people and famous people would come to them. Like even people who, you know, writers, um, famous writers, for example, Tolstoy, uh, Dostoevsky, Gogol, among others, came to Elder Ambrose. Elder Ambrose here is his book. Was the uh, he was like the uh, the crown jewel. He was like the high, at the height of Optina, and he was there. You know, the most important, highest like person. He was very uh, charismatic, and people would come to him. Even people who weren't like the the elders were like recognized even by people who weren't churchgoers. You know, this is a special thing. Like people would be warmed up to um, to the church and, you know, seeking guidance and answers for spiritual questions, even if you weren't religious. That's that's how, like, how, how brightly these people shone forth. And unfortunately, you know, when the, uh, when the Bolsheviks came, they took over Russia and uh, they closed, started closing the monasteries and this line of eldership came, came to an end, which Elder Nikon was essentially the last, the last elder of Otina. So uh, I do want to make a note, um, you know, on eldership that, you know, if, if you did today, we don't really have elders in, in the sense that they consider these who the Otina elders were because, you know, they were a very, very spiritually advanced people. And we don't like our time, our poor times. We don't really have we don't really have elders that you can go to like that, that you could just give you could just like give yourself up to them, their guidance without a hesitation to whatever they would say. Um, and that actually might be a temptation. So I'd, I would I would make a note and and maybe a warning to people not to. You know, don't treat your um, spiritual father or your 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 spirit your your priest um, necessarily as if he was an elder. Like every whatever word he says, it must it must go. You know, in general, uh, if you're just beginning the spiritual life, it's it's okay to you know defer your your judgment to the priest. You know, um, because he's probably he he knows more than you. He's more experienced. But eventually you're going to have to sort of take a little bit of responsibility and learn discretion and try to learn discernment yourself because you can't, you can't, you might even be tempting the priest if you go to him and just, you know, lay everything out. Um, 
uh, like, you know, like your thoughts, for example, people might be where if, if you're like, uh, if you have, if you're not sort of like more experienced in the spiritual life, you're, you can't, you know, you, if you're, if you're unexperienced, you might be reading a book and you, and they say in the book, uh, you know, it'll say, you know, um, this, this person would go to the elder every night, which is something that they practiced to, uh, revelation of thoughts and uh, they would go to the elder and reveal what thoughts they had during the day. And so maybe if you're new to the faith and you read that and you think, oh, well, I got to go and tell my priest this thought and that thought that I had. But revelation of thoughts is really not something that's practiced in uh, parishes, in parish life. Um, uh, revelation of thoughts is not necessarily revealing sins. It's a little different. It sort of completes. It kind of it would round out um, your confession of sins, but it's a little bit different. Um, it's sort of just, you know, clarifying things and uh, you don't necessarily have to reveal your thoughts to your priest. And in fact, he might not have time for that or he might not be experienced enough as these guys, as these elders were, you know, to know how to answer you and to resolve your problems. So don't try. I, I would caution people, try not to look at your spiritual father or your priest as, um, as if he was an elder, an, an unerring guide, you know, you ha we have to be a little cautious there. So, you know, you, it's, it's, it's kind of hard when you're new to the faith and you're reading these things, you're reading the desert fathers, which is good. Um, uh, but you got to have, you know, caution in how you, you can't just apply it to your life and fulfill everything that these people did directly. We would die. You know, these, the, the founders of this, these monasteries, they were like out there hewing out in the wilderness of, you know, like hewing down trees and building these churches and living on bread and water and turnips, you know, that they grew. That was like their food and occasional fish, you know, uh, we, we, we could not do everything that they did, you know, our week, you know, we, we're weak, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. So try to, you know, try, you're going to take a step back when you're reading these things, but, but reading these books is important. You know, spiritual books, spiritual literature is so important to the, to the spiritual life in general. And, you know, so I'll even, sometimes I'll pray, I'll say, God, God bless the people who, who printed this book, who delivered this book to me, who wrote it, who translated it, who made it available. God bless the mailman for bringing it to me in the mail because these books are like, you know, you can do that. You can say prayers like that because that's how important spiritual books are. And uh, Oktin itself, they also, you know, part of their ministry was they were printing, they're translating and, pr and printing out books like um, The Ladder of Divine Ascent, The Philokalia, St. Isaac, these great books, and they would send that to all the monasteries. And that was also uh, kind of a very important thing for this flowering of sanctity that happened in late 19th century Russia. All right. Um, I think that that, con that that is probably the conclusion uh, of my stream today. I rambled on about the Oak Tina elders. Uh, thank you for being with me. Thank you for watching to the end. Uh, you know, write a comment, you know, like, like, the sh like the show. If you, you know, if you appreciate me coming every fifth day, you know, putting my face out there in public on YouTube like this, it takes, it takes a little bit of, you know, this is, it, it takes something. I'm, I'm putting some effort into all this. So, so like the video, you know, just, you, Click doesn't take you much. It you just got to reach out and grab that grab that uh, mouse and click the like button for me. I'll appreciate it. And it's kind of gives me a little motivation to keep coming back if people like what I'm doing. So, you know, press the like button, subscribe, share. Thank you. I will see you next time. Out.